Captain, uh, maybe we ought to turn on the searchlights now. No. That's just what they'll be expecting us to do. Hello, and welcome to episode 88 of Dots, Lines, and Destinations. It's August 6th, 2015. I'm Stephen Seagraves, joined today by Foz Mamoon. Hey, Foz. Hello. How are you doing, sir? I'm great. This is the Ocho Ocho. The Ocho Ocho. Where we're going, we don't need roads. <laughs> it's kind of true. Kind of. We don't have, we don't, make... we don't have Rolo or Seth with us today. No, but I had to go for the Back to the Future reference. <laughs> Once you hit 88, man. It's 30 years old this year. Yeah, it's crazy, isn't it? I know. Make you, does it make you feel old? Oh, I shouldn't have asked that. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I already feel old. I don't need that to make me feel old. Yeah. <laughs> um, today we got a few stories about uh, some diversions, uh, some earning calls, earnings calls, uh, a passport dilemma, and uh, some uproar about pre-check. So I'll just dive right in. Um, this Cathay flight, uh, flight 884, which was from Hong Kong to Los Angeles, uh, diverted. Uh, I guess this was Tuesday or Wednesday. I don't remember what date this was. Um, but it, it actually diverted to Ericsson Air Station on the island of Shimya, Alaska. Uh, kind of a random diversion. <laughs> <laughs> you know, th- this is the week where I'm hearing about places I've never known. The- between this and uh, uh, the reunion in uh, off of Madagascar, I'm like, I have to keep looking at pl- where these places are. Yeah, I, I mean, that's kind of it's kind of crazy. This is Shimya is like part of the Aleutian Islands. It's on the far western edge of uh, the 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 Alaska chain of islands, and it's um, it's all. Uh, it was actually an air station during World War II. Uh, there was some bombers stationed there, and then it became a refueling point. And uh, it just recently, I think Northwest Airlines, I was reading, Northwest Airlines had actually rented out the island for part of their northern Pacific routes that they had back uh, a long time ago. So uh, it, it's got an ILS system for landings, and that's about it. <laughs> wow. And a huge radar station. But I think... What happened was the Cathay flight actually had a uh, some smoke in the cabin, uh, although it's not really clear if it was actual smoke or if it was just the alarm going off for smoke. Um, but it's it's uh, it's interesting. There's actually a video Seth posted on his blog. There's a video on YouTube of the preparation um, to evacuate the aircraft. So they everyone dons their uh, you know the the floats, you know the yellow yellow life life jackets and uh, they're going over instructions on how to use them how to inflate them again and they actually mentioned ditching in the video at some point and um, I'm kind of wondering were they actually considering putting it down in the water um, but uh, everyone was safe so well I mean you know there's a couple things about this that are truly amazing um, one I mean one was how quickly they got a replacement aircraft out there I mean United could learn a thing or two yeah um, cause they were, I mean, what was it? Within hours they had something and it looked, you know, from what I saw, they flew from Shemya to Anchorage. So Shemya must have something because somehow they fixed whatever the issue was to at least get to Anchorage. Yeah. There's still a radar station there. Um, and it, 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 I think there's still people there. I mean, they have bunk, they have like, you know, barracks and things like that. So uh, I'm, I'm sure it's like a skeleton type crew, uh, but they must have something because it's still an actively used airfield. Yeah. So. so there must clearly be ma- some sort of maintenance facilities. Um, so the the I wonder because they, they flew. It's only a three hour flight from Shimya to Anchorage. They flew the passengers to Anchorage, and then um, Cathay had another flight in route to Anchorage within hours, and it picked the passengers up and then flew them down to Hong uh, to L A. From there, uh, making for a really long flight, but. Um, at least everyone was safe. I mean, can you imagine if they had put it, you know, put the plane, they decided to ditch the plane, um, and, you know, out in the middle of the ocean. I mean, that's kind of, that's the crazy part is that they were actually considering it. And it would probably have been one of the few times there had been a ditching in modern history for a yeah, commercial I, airliner. I couldn't tell you the last time a plane was ditched. Uh, the Hudson. That's, that's it. That's yeah. all I can think of. Yeah, that's true. That's true. So, yeah. I mean, it, it, I, I, I would be. I would love to know what actually happened. Um, 
I mean, it, it's it, it's kind of ironic to me that on one point they're talking about ditching the plane, but clearly this plane was able to a divert, land, and also take off again within a few hours to go to Anchorage. So could it have really been that severe of an issue? Yeah, I wonder if they were like if they were trying to sort out what the problem was, and then once they realized, oh, it's just the alarm going off, we don't have an actual fire. That's when they decided, okay, we'll put it down in Shimya. Yeah, maybe. I don't, I don't know. You know, I mean, fire on an airplane is not something you want to deal with. So. But I, I would assume that you don't make the declaration of a ditching up front because you would just cause panic. Yeah, I mean, and, and you hear the, you clearly hear the flight attendant in the video say, we're getting ready for our ditching, which is like, uh. <laughs> was, now, could this have been a language barrier? <laughs> I don't know. I mean, can you imagine on our island hopper if they had told us, <laughs> prepare for ditching? I think we would have all flipped out. I probably wouldn't need to change my underwear when we, if, when we got down. <laughs> So, um, it's an interesting video. Well, I'm sure Seth will post a link to his post and, and, uh, people can watch it, but, uh, glad everyone's okay. Kudos to Cathay for such quick recovery. Yeah. May you start an institute and teach other airlines. Specifically United. Yes. Um, or United Micronesia. Let's be specific here. Yeah. Maybe let the station manager know in Guam that, hey, you have a plane full of passengers that's been delayed for, you know, 13 hours. Details, details. I just love that we walked in there and they were like, you came from where? You've been delayed when? What? Like they had no idea that we were even remotely delayed. Longest rebooking ever. They rebooked an entire 777, a canceled 777 before they got to us. I know. That's the incredible part. They rebooked an entire 777 in the time it took two of the four of us to get rebooked. And yours was never really even done because you got to the you got to the United Club and they were like you still don't have a seat on this flight. <laughs> yes, that's, that's true. That was great. Oh, uh-huh. that was classic. Classic. Yeah. Good times. Um, so the so the airlines kind of had their uh, second quarter uh, earnings calls recently, and it seems like decent news all around. I mean, there's some great earnings in there, uh, but there's some strange news when it comes to uh, Dallas. Uh, it seems that Dallas is struggling uh, for both American and Southwest. Uh, yeah, well, in what's funny is um, the biggest uh, threat to both of them is spirit, which is weird, right? It is weird. It is, but I, I, I you know, I sat through the blog post on this. I didn't realize how much spirit had grown in Dallas. Yeah. I mean, it is substantial, and because you know, I don't know. You, I know you've flown to Dallas, but you know, all everyone but American is in the E, e- pier. Yep. And the E pier has that remote pier. I don't know if you've ever noticed, but it has. It's the one that remote... you go in the tunnel. So you can exactly. Yeah. And you know, for years of flying in and out of Dallas, that was that's been closed. But when I last flew there, that was actually open and being used. Yeah, I remember them saying they were going to reopen it, and, and they were talking about. Um... I mean, I can remember when I was younger and I flew there. It was it used to be open. It was just mm-hmm. a, a it was for like uh, regional jets and stuff. But um, it, I I don't was it Spirit that was all there? Is that what you saw there? Well, I think I'm trying to remember. I think it was partially Spirit and partially U.S. Air. But I think there was a shuffle. But I think the biggest reason for that, I mean, because historically the main concourse of E was underpopulated. Mm, interesting. So right, so e, that means the main pop. Uh, Pure V is fully booked, as is now the remote, which is, I mean, it's great for DFW. Yeah. Uh, but it, clearly it's impacting American a lot. And I, I think the one thing that, I mean, the one thing that would really hurt American right now is, is if Nor- Norwegian made that their next stop. <laughs> oh, yeah. For the long haul stuff. Yep. Yep. Well, they, uh, Spirit actually operates 24 to 24 different destinations out of DFW. I mean, that's a lot. And it's just a small, I mean, it's a small chunk of traffic, but uh, I, I guess it's bringing down prices for both Southwest and American. I mean, it's a small, it seems trivially small, but I mean, when you think about it, how many major destinations are served from DFW, right? Think of all the things that get mainline flights on American. Yeah. Domestically. It's probably, I would say, 100 at yeah. most. Yeah. Right? So there are, they've eaten into 25% of those markets, and it's clear that they're having great success so they're just going to keep eroding more and more of that um which then begs the question what's american going to do right so a lot of americans traffic is feeding into its international so you know that's okay but all the or uh, od stuff that's uh for dallas that's what's really at risk and that's always been i mean let's think about it that's that's probably their most revenue biggest revenue generating hub they have so if things are soft there 
um, it, it really hurts. Yeah, I mean, they're squeezed in New York because there's so much competition be- between all three of them w- outside of the, the low-cost carriers. You know, and JetBlue is very aggressive as well in New York. So they really have three com- three key competitors there. Chicago, they have United and Southwest to a you know a slightly lesser extent. L.A. is just a mishmash of everybody fighting for whatever they can get. Miami, that's probably one of their stronger um, footholds as well. What do but, you? I mean, do you think that they value Phoenix and Philadelphia uh, as as true big hubs? No, Phoenix is so squeezed by Southwest. There's really no real mar- margins on domestic. Yeah, which and I, you know, it's evident U.S. Air never really saw it there, which is why they never really put much in the way of international traffic there. Yeah, All right. So um, Charlotte is probably the one gem from the U.S. Air side. Um, I don't know how much longer they'll hold on to that. You think so? You think that's that's going to be a dying one over Philly? Philly Philly has a lot of competition, but Philly also has a lot of O and D. True, true. Right, and Philly is a convenient point to connect going east to Europe. Charlotte, not the most. You know, depending on where you're starting, you're you have a smaller population that that's a good connection for. But you need longer range planes because, like, out of Philly, they fly some seven fives to the to the across the Atlantic. Um, and Charlotte, the main thing that has helped it survive is the banking industry that's based out of there because there's two or three big banks that are based down there that drive a lot of the high end margin. Yep, yep. But you know, and so that that's what really helps them. But those again are all those are often corporate contracts, so they're not making huge amounts of revenue. But that's what keeps it a sustainable operation. Yeah, and and I mean, all the carriers this quarter kind of stated that they were um, challenged by Dallas, Fort Worth, and and Delta even said that they're challenged by Dallas, Chicago, and Orlando. Um, United said Dallas, Chicago, and Houston were were all on the slacking side, um, and and United stated that uh, they were pinched by a thirty percent drop in corporate oil and gas revenue. Well, think about Houston, right? So Spirit has grown drastically in Dallas. I think Houston's their next um, big target. Yeah, yeah, it is. And and then on the cross down on the south end of town, you've got Southwest that's growing its footprint there. Yeah, and doing some international stuff. So yeah, so they're getting squeezed on both sides, and I and I think that'll continue. And I mean, the oil and gas business is going to get worse because the you know with the Iranian deal, oil dropped even more. Yep. And so their their profit margins. I mean, Exxon Mobil reported a uh, substantial loss this quarter. So the spe- clearly they're going to you know lockdown mode from an expensive standpoint, which means they're like they've been spending money hand over fist the last years because they had they were rolling in it. They can't really afford that for a few for until this thing subsides. But I don't. I think it'll be a few years before it, get, it levels off. What do you What do you think the carriers are going to do? I mean, do you think they're really going to cut back on capacity to kind of control uh, what their yields are? You know, I, I this I, at the moment, given the fact that they're getting sued, I don't think they're going to be cutting capacity for a while. Yeah, I, I think that that would be the last thing they do because they don't want that added attention. Um, but it'll be interesting what they do. I honestly, with with the way oil is and the kind of profits they're seeing, they can afford to drop prices. I, I think we'll see some fair sales this year. Well, we've already seen a couple, right? I mean, you were posting the other day that there was like New York to L.A. For like eighty seven dollars, right? Oh yeah, and there was like Houston to uh, L A or something yesterday, and or Chicago to L A, which is something similar. So, I, but you know, these are these are all what I'll call flash sales. But you know, you think back to five years ago, we used to have sales that would last eight days. Yeah, right. And I think we're going to start seeing some of those. And I really think we're, where we're going to see that the most is in the premium cabin. You think so? Yeah, because well, I won't the, complain. The premium cabin is what drives the bulk of their revenue. And they can, you know, clearly, like, on a coach ticket, sure, they could sell it for 150 bucks. But oh, for that premium ticket that they can sell for 1000 instead of 2000 they can make a lot more money on that. And that's one less upgrade they give away. Well, I'm, I, uh, I will, I gladly welcome our low fare overlords. Yes. <laughs> uh, give me some Portland to Europe or Portland to Asia fares in, in business and I'll be, I'll be happy. And then we will hear about how upgrades have gone away and the program's devalued while we're all buying a thousand dollar tickets to fly across the pond in business. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh darn. <laughs> Some people are just never happy. <laughs> um, so Foz, you had a little bit of a, a, a you have a, a bad time and a good time recently. You had a passport dilemma, but then you had a really 
kind of awesome bump from a, a recent flight. So why don't you tell me about those two things? Well, my passport dilemma is um, I have unknowingly uh, – I was just in Europe last week, and as I'm going through Europe, I somehow didn't really pay attention, but I have run out of pages. <laughs> Oops. And, and, and I have a year and a half left on my passport. I'm like, do I go get a new passport? It, the logical thing is to go get a new passport. Right at this point, just chalk it up because I have to pay for pages anyways. Why, why bother? Just go get a new passport, and then I can go. You know, then I'll have one of the RFID passports, so I can get electronic, um, uh, electric electronic entry into more places. Mm-hmm. The dilemma to this is, I just recently applied for global entry, which is tied to my passport. Oh, uh. because my global entry finally expired. You know, that five year period after seven years finally expired. <laughs> so I'm just like, um. So now this is my dilemma. So I'm like, do I just get pages added or do – because I'm leaving the country again in a few weeks. So I'm like, do I try to um, a, try to uh, get pages added so I can go out of the country in a few weeks or do I try to get a new passport? Uh, and I think I might have an answer. Uh, actually, literally, while we – as we are recording this, I got my approval for Global Entry. So I can now go do my appointment and then go get a new passport. So you can do the global entry against the old passport and then get a new one afterward? Right, because all I have to do is go in and change the passport number. Gotcha. Gotcha. I think that's a good idea. Yeah, so this has been on my mind for a few days, but I'm glad it's resolving itself. So it's pretty cool. Sweet. Um, But my bump was pretty nifty. Um, So I was last week, um, I was flying from San Diego to Heathrow onto Copenhagen. And I get to San Diego. I'm just waiting at the gate, and they announce they need some volunteers. So, I, and I go, sure, I'll volunteer. I'm, I'm game. They're like, well, you'll have to go tomorrow. I'm like, fine, no problem. So they're like, well, we'll, we'll t- put you up, and I'm like, fine, I'm good. And she's like, and I'm like, what's the compensation? She's like, it's eight hundred dollars. I'm like, okay. And I'm sitting here going, eight hundred dollar BA voucher. I'll find a way to make that work. <laughs> so, and you know, at that point. Right at, uh, unlike any domestic bump, right at that moment they debooked me and said, "Just go sit at the ticket counter. We'll be out there in a little bit." Cool. And there was, um, it was myself and a couple who did the same thing. Cool, no problem. So I go out there and um, just chill out. And they come out with these Visa gift cards. I'm like, okay. They're like, "This is your eight hundred dollars." I'm like, oh, okay. And I'm reading the thing and like, you can pull cash off of it, so you don't actually have to use it for travel. <laughs> Uh, but sneakily, they're only good for 60 days. Whoa. So the fir- yeah, so it, it, ingenious in some ways, but you can go pull cash. So the first cash withdrawal is free. Subsequent cash withdrawals, there is a fee of like two bucks or something. Um, so I'm actually later today, I'm going to try to go pull the cash off of it. Um, cause it was in my bag and I just remembered to do it. But so, you know, nifty. They put me at the Sheraton across the street, which I coincidentally got a stay credit for and full points. Nice. And they gave me $75 worth of food. I'm like, bonus. Sounds great. So, if, you know, fast forward the next day. And, oh, oh. so, and they, they told me they would take care of my rebooking. This is where things get a little weird. So, I'm like, okay. So, later that night, I'm look, I pull up my reser- and, and But what they said, we'll take care of your rebooking, but don't call reservations because they won't know what's going on. Interesting. I'm like, that's really concerning, but okay. So, you know, later that night, I pull up my reservation. Still no update. I'm like, Flight from Heathrow to Copenhagen still there, but the first flight's disappeared. Fast forward to the next morning, same thing. Fast forward to the afternoon, same thing. I'm like, okay. <laughs> so I end, end up even making my way to the airport, present myself, mention I was one of the volunteers. Like, oh, yeah, yeah, we, we've got you rebooked. And they end up having me um, – I because of I was now flying into Heathrow on a Saturday, there's fewer flights. So I was now doing a forced overnight. In Heathrow. In Heathrow. So I'm like, oh, so I'm like, what flights did they rebook me on? And they tell me, I'm like, oh, so I have to spend a whole night in Heathrow. They're like, yeah. I'm like, uh, can I get a hotel for that since it's it's a forced overnight? Like, oh, yeah, you should. She's like, I'll put it in the notes so you can go go get in Heathrow. I'm like, okay. Now I was going to have a forced overnight anyways on my original ticket, but I wasn't really going to offer that. <laughs> so you know, so sure enough, she prints out a boarding pass and. Um, like mosey, and I'm like, oh, how full are you? She's like, oh, we're pretty full today. I'm like, you need any volunteers? She's like, no, no, we're good today. I'm like, fine, no problem. <laughs> mosey, you know, eventually go to the lounge for a little while. Mosey over to the gate. As I'm walking back from the gate, the manager, 
who I had interacted with the night before comes up to me and goes, oh, how was your stay? How was the hotel? I'm like, oh, it was good. She's like, want to do it again? I'm like, sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, she's like, okay. Um, I'm like, but my only stipulation is I need to be in Copenhagen by um, by Monday morning. She's like, okay. She's like, let me see what I can find. Unfortunately, we couldn't find anything that would get me to Copenhagen by Monday morning. The word, the best would be like Monday af- late afternoon, early evening, and my I had a different ticket coming back, so I was not able to take advantage of it. So a little bummed, but you know I still can't really complain. It was a good trip, and it, so it would have been kind of awesome if you had gotten that second one. I know it would have paid for the whole ticket, and so you know I eventually wake my make way when I get to Heathrow. I end up waking, making my way to the counter and explain the situation. And, you know, it took forever because there was one person working at the counter. And, you know, I, I got to the counter and there was a couple up there with a stack of passports and a stack of paperwork. I'm like, this is going to take a while. <laughs> so I'm just sitting there waiting and waiting and waiting. And then one of the um, other gentlemen from the first class side wandered over and because he, he had seen I was still standing there. He's like, oh, let me help you. So, you know, he pulls up and uh, they end up putting me a in the Sophie Tale. Oh, nice. <laughs> Not a bad place to stay for, you know, on someone else's dime. So that was my bump story. That's nice, man. Yeah, it was it was a pretty cool experience. I I would do it again. That's that's I mean, and this was this was one of those Copenhagen San Diego fairs or Copenhagen US fairs that was relatively cheap in business. Yeah, I think all this, this ticket was Copenhagen to Newark and then San Diego to Copenhagen. I think it was about 1400 in business. So you, you you paid 600 bucks for a business class ticket basically. Yeah. So the one the interesting thing is I've got the boarding pass sitting in front of me right now because whatever they did to rebook me, I never got the flight credit for the first flight. Interesting. Yeah. So I guess they they must have some manual. I suspect what happened is they built me a new reservation and then applied the e ticket to that. I wonder why they would do that though. Do they? You think they have that much trouble with, um, uh, like rebooking someone or you know m- moving off a flight or merging reservations? This was an AA issued ticket, so that might have been the challenge. Oh yeah, you gotta give me the details, man. I, I, I honestly had completely forgotten as we're, until we're talking about it. I'm like, oh, yeah. This, this. And it's funny because I asked the woman, I'm like, so did you guys just book a new reservation and then apply the e-ticket? And she's like I, – and I don't think she understood the question, but she said yes. <laughs> she's she's probably like, what is this – how does he know? Yeah, he, <laughs> <laughs> Who are you? <laughs> Who are you and why do you keep bumping on our airline? <sighs> um and I think the last story will make it a quicker show. Uh, the last story is some uproar about pre-check. And you were mentioning this before we got started. What What is this exactly? Well, I, you know, it's, it's something we have personally lamented for a while is that all these people are in pre-check that aren't paying for it or aren't qual- you know, going through the program through, air, you know, primarily through the airline's invitation. And it, I, I don't know what your pre-check experiences are, but, like, there are places where pre-check is worthless. Yeah. Uh, I mean, Newark is a great example. Like, I... Have at this point, for the most part, I go through security in A rather than C because, it, like, it, while they don't have um, pre-check in A, they they have pre-check light, which oh. is so you at least get the card and you don't have to take your shoes off. I don't mind pulling my laptop out, but um, C has just been a disaster, and they keep closing the lanes as well. That's the other thing I don't understand. So it's like musical chairs with lanes. So the and. It's been a pet peeve of mine, but there's just too many people in there. It's just like United's Mileage Plus. There's too many entitled, over-entitled people in it. <laughs> uh, that's not going to get anybody fired up. No. no, no. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, so I guess this is becoming a more common thing, and more and more people are complaining about this because clearly people are paying into the program, but they're not getting value into it. Unlike Mileage Plus where we don't pay into it. We just you know sell our soul for it. I, 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 well, you know what? It's interesting. I noticed uh, the last few weeks at Portland – uh, at Portland's airport, the the lines for pre-check have been longer than anything I ever remember. I mean, I used to take 7 a.m. flights all the time last year, and I'd be the only one in the pre-check line. Uh, but now it's 10, 15, 20 people deep, and some of them don't know why they're in the line. They just go there because they're told to go there, and then uh, they take off everything, their shoes, their belt, everything out of their pockets, 
Okay. Well, in my personal opinion, is the moment you do that, you never get to go and pre check again. <laughs> you cannot listen to ins- read instructions or pay attention to what you're being, because that's what I love. Is people will be, you know, there'll be a bouncer saying, "Don't take out your laptops, don't take off your shoes," and Billy Joe is sitting there taking off his belt and stripping himself down. It's like, dude, did, did you, you not, not hear him? <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's so, funny. It'll be nice. But I mean, it's you know, it's like it's if you remember, they had those um um. Before pre-check, they had the the ski lanes, the black diamond, the green, and the blue. Mm-hmm. Yep. I almost think we. If, I wonder if we need that for like pre-check, where like you get graduated and like you know you get different levels of pre-check depending on how you behave and how long you've had it. Yeah, like two two beeps means you know you get to go through the beginner's line. Three beeps, you get to go through the moderate line, and then four beeps, you just walk on through with all your luggage in hand. Exactly, exactly, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> they let you fly the plane. <laughs> they give you staff credentials. Yeah, exactly. Crew known crew member. Yeah, yeah, uh, exactly. You know. Um, well, I think that pretty much wraps up today's show. Uh, this week's show. It's a, it's a little bit of a shorter show, but. Uh, Without half the crew here, you know, you know, without Seth here, I'm gonna give him a little bit of a hard time. The show's a little bit shorter. <laughs> Seth, but what about Skipper Rolo? Uh, we haven't had him on the show in a few weeks. We gotta find that guy. I think we need to start calling him Captain Stubing. Yeah, I'm a little worried about him. He's out there. Think... He's he's out there on the boat all by himself. I don't think you need to worry based on the pictures. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, tell everybody where they can find you, Foz. Uh, primarily Twitter as FozM. Sweet. Uh, I'm Stephen Seagraves. You can find me on Twitter at SCGraves. I uh, also blog occasionally at badice.com. You can follow Dots, Lines, and Destinations at Dots, Lines on Twitter uh, or moredotsmorelines.com. We also have a Facebook page, though I don't ever look at it. Um, yeah, thanks for listening, and we'll uh, catch you next time. Bye-bye. <laughs>